So, good afternoon. If you new to coming to the Bible or you're not sure whether you could should read it or why bother about it or you don't understand it, then hopefully this uh, talk will be of some help to you to uh, perhaps allay some of the reluctance you might have to want to read your Bible. I think we've got it working now. Um, yeah, it, it, it is interesting that a lot of people seem to be very reluctant to uh, uh, open your Bible, the Bibles, and, and read from it. If I give you a couple of examples of, in my own experience, with colleagues at work some time ago now, um, I, I agree, but um, you know, the, the, these two individuals, they're, they're very learned people. They, they've got scientific qualifications. They're used to reading uh, scientific journals and scientific um, textbooks and, and analysing what they have to say and uh, coming to conclusions from them. And the one lady, she said to me one day, well, you know, you, you can't read the Bible. It's, it's so big and, and thick. And yet the very next week, there she was sitting in our staff room reading a novel, which was easily as thick as the Bible, if not thicker. And she managed to uh, get through that in a week. But she didn't think she could cope with the Bible. Another individual, he was quite a religious person. He went to church regularly. In fact, he was the organist at his local church. Uh, and he said to me, well, it, it's not for me to read the Bible. Uh, the, 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 the vicar will tell me what, what it's all about. And yet if I'd gone to him and said, look, I've just read this article in, in one of the journals with this new scientific idea, uh, and told him what it said. He wouldn't have taken my word for it. He'd have gone straight to that journal and read it up for himself. But there was that reluctance there uh, to want to open his Bible uh, and and look look at it. I think people are often put off by what they think they're going to find in the Bible, or, or what they've been told about the Bible, rather than from their own experience. That they expect the Bible to be harder than it really is. Maybe that's you. It's true that there are parts of the Bible that are difficult to understand, but there's also much of it that's easy to understand, even understood by a child. So let's briefly look at the background to the Bible. So try to introduce you to it so that when you open it, it's, you've got some idea what you're going to find and dispel, hopefully, some of the reluctance that you might have to read in the Bible for yourself, to give you a glimpse of what you'll find when you open your Bible and begin to read it. The first thing you, you often see on the front cover, as you can see there, it'll say, Holy Bible. So what does that mean? Well, the word Bible literally means book or collection of books. Uh, and the word holy means something that's separate, something that's set apart. Uh, and the Bible then is set apart from other books because it's revealing to us a message from, from God. The Bible actually isn't one book, but it's rather a collection of books and letters. Uh, it's been likened to a, a library. Uh, and it contains a variety of subjects. It contains law, it contains history, it contains poetry, uh, wise saints, there's prophecy, uh, and there's biography, mainly of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are letters written to uh, some to churches and some to individuals. Now, in this library of books, there are actually 66 books. And there are 40 different individuals that uh, penned th those, those books. Uh, and these writers were from different backgrounds and lived in different countries. Uh, and they wrote over a period of something like 1,600 years. Now, as we said, the, the writers were from different backgrounds and different occupations. We find that there were kings and princes there, there were shepherds and farmers, there were priests, there were fishermen, 
there's a doctor uh, and there's even a tent maker. It wasn't originally written in, in our language, of course. It was originally written, the Old Testament in Hebrew, uh, a little bit of it in Aramaic, and some in Greek. And of course, because it wasn't written in our language, it's had to be translated for us, hasn't it? And at different times, scholars have produced different translations, which we sometimes call versions, uh, in order to try and make the, the message easier for us to understand in, in our own language and in our own background. And that can sometimes confuse people and perhaps put people off from wanting to open their Bibles, wondering, well, which translation should we use? Do I use this one or, or that one? But in fact, um, most of the commonly available translations, they're okay. It does, doesn't really matter that much. Uh, well, none of them are perfect. There's, they've all got some sort of uh, problems. Um, but in the main, they will give you the basic truths of what the Bible message okay. is all about. Usually books are about one particular subject. You, you be a history book or a geography book or maybe a biography of somebody's life. But what makes the Bible different and special and unique it is the variety of subjects that it uh, covers, as we've already said. Some of the mentioned, some of them. You know, you've you, you've got those that are listed on on the screen there. Uh, you've got um, mem memoirs. You've got poetry. You've got songs. You've got prophecy and instructional writings. And it also contains a law, a law given to the nation of Israel by God, through Moses. But it's a, a law like no other, quite different from, say, the law of our land, because of the, the wide variety uh, of subjects uh, it covers, the, the breadth of them. As we've got there on the screen, there's civil law, criminal law, religious laws, how to observe serving God. And you've got dietary uh, and sanitary rules. And now that's interesting, and that makes the Bible a bit special, it is those dietary and sanitary rules and regulations. They are so advanced for their time that modern medicine has only recently come to recognize their value. One of the most obvious things we could turn to is the, the rules concerning washing uh, remember, in the co in during COVID, we were told wash your hands, wash your hands, and wash this and wash that. Well, in, under the law uh, in the Bible, the Jews were instructed to wash their hands before doing certain tasks, and and other things had to be washed meticulously, uh, and other sanitary things that you can find in that law. How did the author, the writers, know about the value? of those sanitary rules several thousand years before they became known to, to us and when the nations around them had nothing else like it. Uh, and this is one area that marks the Bible out as being special. And, and therefore, because it's special, it's worth looking at and reading, isn't it? Now, th now, these facts we've just given you um, make the Bible unique. And the fact that it is so unique surely is something worth reading, isn't it? But, but there's something more important about the Bible that makes it worth reading. The marvel of the Bible is that despite those wide differences in time uh, and in place uh, and in author, there's one consistent message. And they all make one amazing claim, that their message was given to them by God, the one true God who created all things, the well the individuals were the ones who actually put pen to paper. The author of what they wrote was God. 
and, and throughout the Bible, the, the writers will make statements such as, the word of the Lord came to me saying, or thus says the Lord, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and that the claim to be written under God's guidance is perhaps summarized for us in the first of Timothy chapter three, and which we uh, had read together earlier. And in that verse 16, we have all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be clear, complete, thoroughly equipped to every good work. It's profitable, it says there. So if God is the creator who was guiding the writings of the Bible, would he expect it to be different from human books, wouldn't it? We expect it to be special compared to other books. And as it says in these verses, it definitely is profitable. It's profitable to us to, to read it. But you might be thinking, oh, it's so easy to say that. It's, it's easy to make these claims. But how can we be sure they're true? It, it could be one big elaborate hoax. Um, and it was all written by uh, someone uh, much later than he claimed to be. Uh, and uh, it was just one clever, uh, imposter that had done it all. Now, if it was the product of an imposter, a hoaxer, then it would show itself in various in inaccuracies and contradictions. If it was the product of a hoaxer, then we would see inaccuracies in, in what it presents to us. And the fact that we can't find any inaccuracies or contradictions helps us to believe the Bible's claim uh, to be from God. We just want to mention two things um, very briefly, which help to show us that it's reliable. Uh, and the first of those is its historical ac accuracy. Uh, and that's what makes the Bible stand out from all other books. You see, when, when say, on, on the, the television, they, they want to produce a, a period drama, so like Downton Abbey or that, that sort of thing, the producers of that programme go to a great deal of length to get the settings right, to get the costumes right, uh, and the, the things that they do and say right. And yet, invariably, someone will spot something and say, ah, that doesn't fit. They wouldn't have done that or said that in, in that day and age. And they'll find some sort of inaccuracy. But not so with the Bible. You can try to do that, but uh, it doesn't work. When it describes historical events, we find that the archaeologists come along uh, and they demonstrate its accuracy. Even um, fairly recently written historical books about perhaps fairly recent history, say the, the last war or something, um, the author will write it and then some other expert will come along and challenge what they've said uh, and dispute some of the facts as to whether they're ac ac accurate. In the past, there have been occasions when scholars have said, uh, ah, that isn't right what the Bible says. It never happened like that. Uh, in fact, one example, uh, people used to say, oh, Babylon never existed. Uh, it's a place we read about and kings of Babylon we read about in the Bible. And they say, well, never such a place as Babylon. It's all wrong. But then the archaeologists find, uh, digging around, find the, the remains of that city. And they find everything about it is exactly as was described in the Bible. Now, that, that's just one example very briefly, but um, we could spend a the afternoon just talking about similar things. The, the other thing we could talk about is the textual accuracy uh, of the Bible. And, and critics have tried to find 
contradictions in, in the Bible, where one part seems to go against what it says in another part, but they fail. In, in fact, there was one man some years ago now who wrote a book called Undesigned Coincidences, where he tries to show that there are a number of places in, in the Bible where comments were made, seemingly um, insignificant comments, which, which throw some light on um, and, and gives additional information on something mentioned elsewhere in another part of the Bible. And yet the two passages were not directly connected with each other. Uh, and the one writer wasn't trying to provide any support for, for the others. In other words, it was sort of like a co coincidence that they collaborated each other and helped each other. Uh, and that's evidence for us of the genuineness and the accuracy of the Bible. The, the writers were genuinely recording what happened and what was said, rather than trying to make what they write fit with some uh, some other passage. And so we can trust the Bible that is telling the truth. Now, each of those two subjects could be expanded if time permitted. But okay, even if the Bible is different and special in so many ways, is, is that a good reason to read it? Does it matter if we don't? Well, one of the things in the Bible is that there are a number of themes which run right through the Bible from beginning to end. Uh, and even though the passages were written hundreds of, or even thousands of years apart by, by different writers under different circumstances, it, each passage develops uh, and adds to the, the theme so that it gives a, a constant and unfolding message. Just look very briefly at um, some, of the, some of these. One of them is sin and death. That's an important theme which runs right through the Bible, beginning right at the beginning in Genesis and right through to, through to the end. So uh, it, it explains to us what sin is, that sin is disobedience to God. It explains to us why we die, because death is a punishment for sin. And it explains to us the need to seek the forgiveness uh, of sins. And that, that's a big subject when you think about it, a subject which surely we all really want to know about uh, and to understand. And so we need to read the Bible to understand this and find the details uh, of the, those things about sin and death. And another important theme that runs through the Bible is that of a promised seed. By a seed there we mean a, a descendant from someone. A promised seed, a promised descendant who will overcome sin and who will reconcile man with God, and who will bring blessings on the whole earth. And that's a theme that begins right at the beginning in Genesis chapter 3. And it, it runs right through the Bible, um, from when man first sins right to the end. Uh, and it's developed with promises that God made to a man called Abraham, and then to a king called David, in Jerusalem, and then through the Old Testament prophets. And gradually, that theme is developed, and, and it builds up a, a detailed picture uh, of the promise, this promised seed, and what he would be like, and what things that he would do. Uh, and the Jews gave him a title, the Messiah. And then the New Testament comes along and it shows us how Jesus Christ is that promised descendant uh, and would fulfill all these promises that were made there in the Old Testament. 
And alongside those themes is the theme that uh, God um, has a plan uh, and has a purpose when he created the earth. He didn't just sort of do it for fun. He knew what he was doing and he, he had a plan and he had a purpose. Uh, and it's a plan which can actually involve us if we understand what it is and, and take action to be part of it. Isaiah says, um, thus saith the Lord who created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he had established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, there is none else. So a clear statement there that God created the earth to be inhabited, not to be destroyed. Or if we go back to the book of Numbers earlier on in, in our Bibles, uh, God says there, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. So he's telling us there that the earth won't always be as chaotic as it is now when people ignore God. But Numbers 14 there tells us that he has a plan and a purpose. Or again, going back to Isaiah, it says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And throughout the Bible, we, we were given little cameo pictures of that time uh, when it comes, when all the earth is full of the knowledge of the glory of the earth. Uh, and it shows us how glorious and, and marvellous that time will be. But it also tells us what God requires of us in order to be a part of that plan and a part of that purpose. So the Bible is worth reading in order to discover about that plan and discover how we can be a part of it. So why, why should we read the Bible? Because the Bible gives us a direction for living. Your word is a lamp to my feet, it says, and a light to my path. And it explains then what we need to do to be part of God's plan. Read the Bible because the Bible gives us hope. So whatsoever things were written before and were written for our learning, before in our Bibles, that is, that through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So those things that are written in our Bibles are there to give us hope. Now, there doesn't seem to be much to look forward to these days, does there? Uh, with the world in such chaos. But through the Bible, we, we can see beyond today's troubles to a brilliant future planned by God. When God gave his law to Israel through Moses, Moses explained the law to the people. And then he said, to them, see, today I have set before you life and death, life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to know his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you go in to possess. So the Lord he gave them was to, he was setting before them life and death, good and evil. And he sums it up. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you that I've set before you life and death, blessings and curse, cursings. Therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. When Jesus comes along, 
he also sets before us the same choice. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now, it, now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. So he's setting before us then life and death. Follow God's word, which are written to us in the Bible, and live, not just any life, but live forever in God's kingdom on earth. But ignore those like these words, and we die. So why read the Bible? Read the Bible because it's setting before us literally life and death. And of course, I'm sure you will want to choose life. And how do you choose life? By opening your Bibles and reading it and trying to follow what it says for you. So I hope that encourages you to open up your Bibles and read it for yourselves. Thank you.